Hi, everybody. This is your host, Bonnie Squires, host of Bonnie's Beat. We like to bring people to the neighborhood who are doing important things for society, whether it's academia, whether it's athletics, music, literature, art, social services, whatever. And today, I've got a special guest. Her name is Carol Austin, and she is the executive director of an agency called First Up. It used to be called DeVacy, and nobody ever knew what all those initials stood for, right, Carol? So they were- That's just, right. And they it was the Delaware Valley something something for early childhood education. Nobody could ever remember what DeVacy stood for. So she took over and she got the name changed. And there are other changes as well. So welcome, Carol. Hi, Bonnie. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And the snow is gone, thank heavens. The snow was- <laughs> Well, almost. Almost, almost. We still have the residual parts of it left, but yeah. Okay. At least it's not snowing. It's not snowing now, thank heavens. And my new snow guy, um, Neil Kearney, showed up nine o'clock in the morning and he and his teenage son and another teenager might have been a boyfriend. They did a great job. Not that I'm going anywhere because I'm avoiding COVID-19. I can't wait to see the end of 2020. How about mm. you, Carol? Yeah, I, I'm with you on that completely. You know, I've already been saying, okay, great. We're, this is going to be over. And then 2021, I have named the year the Phoenix because we're going to rise from the ashes. Yeah, going to rise from the ashes of 2020. Well, it'll be another year that we have to be wearing masks still. Mm -hmm. Really. And anybody that tells you otherwise is daydreaming. Mm. Well, maybe not quite the year of the Phoenix. Then. Maybe it'll be 2022. We'll see. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway. Okay, Carol, first up, which is the newly named, not so newly named, what is it, two years now? Yeah, I think uh, two years now we've had that name. It used to be the Delaware Valley Association for the Education of Young Children. Yes. DeVacy. D-V-A-E-Y-C, DeVacy which nobody could ever remember what all those letters stood for. <laughs> That's right. And how long have you been the executive director? So I've been the executive director for two and a half, um, whoa, not two, five and a half, four and a half years now, 2016. How many is that? That's four and a half years, right? I'm yes. Math. Words are my thing, <laughs> not math. <laughs> Same here as you can tell. I can't even remember. Since um, June of 2016. So that would be four and a half years. Wow. Oh, Okay. So you were the, who started the name change idea? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, the national, we were affiliated with the National Association for the Education of Young Children, NACI. And um, NACI changed their strategic direction four and a half years ago through this entire process. And as part of that process, um, you know, they, like I they changed the structure. So since we were no longer going to be an affiliate, of NACI, we obviously needed to change our name since we were no longer going to be an affiliate. Um, and, you know, that's that's pretty much the way that all of the affiliates, but one affiliate in Pennsylvania went to, to disaffiliate um, because of the new structure. It's completely a business decision. So that's where it started. Who came up with the name first up? Well, that was a combined effort. We so we we did some um we had some board members, some interested parties, uh you know, friends of the board, staff members. Uh we had a number of names who went through this process with a marketing company and a number of names that were proposed and then we had folk weigh in on the names and you know, we thought, wow, first up, this is we are, you know, we work with the adults who are first up in a child's life. Because with young children, you can't work with and serve young children without serving their parents because they're not independent. And so these adults, teachers, directors, parents, family members are first up in a child's life. And uh, that's what we care about. So we thought the name really resonated. Now, do you run any child care centers? We don't. We don't run any child care centers at all. We work uh, to increase the quality 
of child care um, centers and to work with teachers to support them in their own educational um, attainment and development, but we don't run any child care centers. Okay. Now, I have to divulge the fact that I'm a past president of the Terry Lynn Lokoff Child Care Foundation. Yes, you are. And um, for, oh, like 25 or 30 years, that foundation was very busy encouraging early childhood teachers to go on and get a four-year degree or get a master's degree. And especially, we encouraged men to be early childhood educators because there were never too many of them when we had our uh, National Teachers Awards. And someone on your staff, your Tyrone Scott, who is your government relations and communications director, he reached out to Jamie Lokoff from the Lokoff Foundation and said, let's talk about a merger. So what made you and your board decide you needed to merge with another agency? Well, actually, you know, when Tyrone reached out, he reached out uh, to Jamie because we were interested in honoring Kay. Kay had, had just passed, and we have this Champions Award um, program every year. We thought, you know, we'd really love to recognize Kay. And uh, Jamie thought, well, you know, I don't know if my mom would be into that, um, but, you know, let's talk. It seems like our organizations do similar, you know, have a similar focus or at least interest in teachers and the development there and uh, celebrating teachers. So this uh, started really informally. Out of that meeting, we got together, we started to talk about what we do and, and talk about our, our mutual vision. And inside of that conversation, the, the, uh, the thought, the conversation about merging, you know, it was uh, broached by, by Jamie. You know, um, we didn't use that word. We definitely talked about partnering, the opportunity to partner. And, you know, as we had a, a, a additional discussions, this is really where it led, um, which, you know, I'm really excited about because, you know, we really did find that, you know, we care about the same thing. Our focus is on high quality. Our focus is on teachers. Uh, you know, it just, it just made perfect sense. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, I want our viewers to understand that the Terry Lynn Lokoff Child Care Foundation was founded by Kay Lokoff and her husband, Fred, to honor the memory of their daughter, Terry Lynn, who was an early childhood educator, who at the age of like 24, was driving home from their vacation home on Long Beach Island and was killed in a, a car crash. And Kate, Kay Lokov was brave enough to instantly say, I want to start something that will keep her name alive, that will fulfill her mission, because she loved being an early childhood educator. And contrary to misconceptions, early childhood educators are not babysitters. They are teachers in the true sense of the word. And the foundation ran a number of programs. And the highlight of the year was always the uh, teacher awards where they had a national competition and they had big time sponsors. Uh, I hope Johnson & Johnson will continue with their children's Tylenol sponsorship because we would get hundreds of people that would come to the teacher ceremony. And I was always able to get State Representative Jim Roebuck from the Education Committee to come and give a charge to all these teachers who were from 50 different states and sometimes foreign countries because anybody who's a, a, a child care teacher for a military installation, even though they're located in France or Germany or England, they're also eligible to be nominated. So you guys have picked up the baton, right? Yes, we have, and we're excited about that. <laughs> now, it's not going to be where it used to be at the Police Touch Museum because it's not going to be indoors, and it's not going to be as early as it used to be. Do you have any details yet for next year, whether we're working on that? Ironically, we have a next planning committee meeting this um, in about two hours. 
So yes, we we're thinking obviously to your point, Alani, earlier, it would be it would have been lovely to be able to have the event live. Last this year we had to pivot and we had a virtual event and it was actually fabulous. And um, you know, given people's concerns and we want to be sensitive to the teachers coming from various environments, and we don't know, you know, ultimately what what maybe look like, but we need to plan. So we're moving ahead and planning another exciting virtual event we're thinking may um, but the applications are out there already for you know teachers to be able to apply uh, to and we'll, we'll just have it be great and extraordinary in the way that it was this year virtually and the uh, applications are online yes at firstup.org at firstup.org the terry lynn lokoff teacher award applications so if you know of teachers, I'll say this, I mean, it's really great. It's such an incredible opportunity to celebrate those early childhood teachers, you know, which, you know, there's not a, a whole lot there, you know, they're frontline, you know, working with children in programs day to day and just a really great opportunity for anybody to be able to recognize and honor somebody who's a teacher who could, you know, that bit of recognition goes a long, long way. Well, part of the application process is for that early child care teacher to come up with a program that he or she would like to have funded and the prize is a thousand dollars 500 to be spent on anything that's needed for the program and 500 the teacher can spend any way he or she wants and the programs they come up with I remember going out to a Johnson & Johnson facility years ago when I was the, uh, the president of the foundation. And the, uh, the, the course, the class was teaching little, I mean, I'm talking little kids, like three-year-olds, four-year-olds about the French Impressionists and then having them draw their idea of the painting that they mm. Those two. The paintings were fabulous that the kids did. It was amazing. So these are the kinds of things, and they have things that deal with insects and animals and uh, all kinds of interesting experiences. And there's a committee of people who are experts in early childhood education who go through these and there are 50 winners that have been selected through the years, each year, 50. But there were hundreds of applications. So I don't know if you're going to continue with having 50 winners. Yes, look, we want to celebrate as many teachers as possible. And, you know, given the current environment that we're all in, you know, we are rethinking about really what works best. So because the goal here, teachers being recognized and, and, and celebrated. So you know, there will likely be, and we're in the process now of, of, discover, of uh, determining that, some slight tweaks to that, because we also recognize that there are a number of teachers who, you know, they were working um, prior to COVID and they needed to be laid off. And there were some, and they intend, they're fully committed to the early childhood field. They intend to be teaching. You know, so we've been looking at should we eliminate people because they're not currently like today employed or they're employed and then in a month they're not. So, you know, we're, we're looking at all of that um, in these <laughs> unusual times, you know, this one year, um, they, they may look a little bit different um, inside of that because we're in, in quite different times. But yeah, absolutely, the teachers will get an award. We're gonna, you know, celebrate and honor those high quality teachers. Um, the the sponsor is back, yes, for this year, the the, the main sponsor. And uh, it, it is going to be extraordinary for them. And, and to your point, Bonnie, the projects, you know, from this past year were just so amazing. So amazing what people are up to, really exciting to see, um, you know. The thing is that there are teachers who teach special needs kids, mm -hmm. there are teachers I remember one project for her students who were deaf. And it's really exciting to see the creative ways completely come up with, with projects for their classroom, or they need a piece of equipment that will benefit all the students. 
And that's what the awards are for. Yeah. Early childhood teachers are among the most creative people. Just unbelievable what they come up with. Yeah. One of the interesting things that I always enjoy, there used to be when it wasn't COVID, that all of the winning teachers were flown to the Philadelphia area and they were put up for two days in a hotel. And there was always a breakfast meeting and we got each teacher to stand up and say who she was, who he was, where they taught uh, something about themselves. And the amazing thing is as the years went on and Kay Lokoff every year at the award ceremony would encourage them to go back to school. Most of them had like a, a two year certificate. She wanted them to get at least four year certificates. And I remember as the um, years went by, we had people with master's degrees mm -hmm. that were that were part of the early childhood core. I mean, that's so amazing because they bring so much more to the table the more education they have. Yeah, yes, I'm I'm with you on that. You know, and um, you know, we encourage uh, the same because it it just supports you know teachers and. Um, in in many ways, of course, there's the educational background that they get to bring, but then that that sense of of self as well that comes with with uh, that additional credential. So, you know, at first uh, we're looking for um, ways, and we we currently are teaching some infant toddler courses courses specifically for infant toddler teachers, and we're going to do some for um, pre K teachers you know, in the setting that will will allow pe more people to go back to college because they'll get nine college credits, oh, that's you know, true. for that course. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's amazing. We, wanna, we want to have school be more accessible. You know, when you're a working, often working parent, teacher, it's not that easy to go back after you've been out of school for a while. You know, and um, so we want to um, have, like I said, be that have it be really accessible for folks so that they can go back to school and get those bachelor's degrees, like you said, and those master's degrees. So we're partnering with colleges and universities to be able to to um, teach that coursework um, in a way that, yeah, and then and then they will grant credit, you know, once the teachers matriculate, and so it's fantastic, really good stuff. I always like to let my viewers know something about the background of the person I'm interviewing. So Carol, you have to tell us, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? What did you major in in college, et cetera? <laughs> it's great. So I actually grew up in Barbados. You know, I was born and raised there in the first 18 years of my life. You don't have a drop of an accent. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> well, let me tell you, uh, Sometimes they'll come out. The more, the longer we talk, you may start to hear it, Bonnie. <laughs> so yeah, I, I lived there for the first 18 years of my life. So it's quite um, extraordinary. And um, then I went to college here. Where'd you um, go to school? First at Hunter College in New York City, Hunter as a matter College. of fact. Yeah. Girls school. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Donna Shalala, who was Health and Human Sec, um, oh, yeah. I think she was HUD, yes, Health and Human Services Secretary um, years ago. She actually, at the time, was the uh, chancellor, was the uh, president of the college. So anyhow, that's just interesting. But then I finished up here um, at Rosemont College, and then I got my master's at Temple University in education. So um, so education is something that has always been a passion for me. I felt I had such an incredible education. And um, what was your first job out of college? My first job out of college. Oh, my first job out of college actually was working with Philadelphia um, Academies, Philadelphia Academies Incorporated, yes, um, downtown. And they were the first business schools um, partnership in the country and they worked with high schools high school students so much of my career was actually spent working with on behalf of high school students which is interesting um, from there I quickly moved to you know I did some work with the school district as part of um, you know a liaison I was working through a nonprofit called communities and schools and then Philadelphia Youth Network um, once again 
at the high school level working on high school education reform and um, and then youth unemployment and the whole world of that. So it was really, really, really exciting to watch young people move through and, and gain some success and uh, structure systems, work on structuring systems that would allow for that for them as well. So my whole world before early childhood was high school. Was high school. Well, my first job out of 10 was at Yaden High School. Oh. I taught 10th grade English and literature. And because I also had a minor in French, they asked me to teach the top eighth and ninth grade class. It was a joint school. So I is that now Penwood? Penwood High School? Is Yaden High School renamed now? It's not called Yaden anymore. I'm not sure what it's called. I think it's called Penwood now. Might be. Anyway, it was a wonderful community, a great integrated community, black and white and Jewish and, and Catholic and uh, Presbyterian and Protestant. And there, there, there were no problems. There, were, there was no racial conflict. It's very interesting. The, the kids were fabulous. I loved it. Yeah. I'm still in contact. Now, I taught so long. I probably taught before you were born, Carol. What can I tell you? But I still have students that I'm still in touch with. And wow. Time to time, which is very nice. They There's nothing like a teacher. We all remember those teachers, don't we? I mean, I remember... Mrs. Vaughn, I remember Miss Blackman, I remember the key teachers, Mr. Cadogan, in my life that made such a profound difference. Bonnie. Do you ever go back to Barbados for vacation? I do. I do. Um, I was actually there, I think, twice last year. You can't um, go this year because you can't fly anywhere. I know. Yeah, c'est la vie. That's how that is for right now. But yeah, I do. I do go back. Mm -hmm. I'm not as connected as you are. To, you know your students but I've seen some of uh, one of my old teachers in going back as well um, one of the classes that I taught at Yaden a few years ago had their like 40th reunion or I forget which reunion it was and they invited me as their guest and it turned out I was the evening's entertainment because for 20 <laughs> minutes I went around all the tables and told them what I remembered about them. Made them oh laugh. my goodness! Made them laugh a lot. Fortunately, I have a good memory. But um, you have a great memory. Yeah, sometimes depends what the subject is. I don't know. I can remember anything from forty years ago. They may. I mean, I love teaching. I did, but then in those days, if you had kids, then you didn't teach anymore. Then I became. Mm. I became a freelance writer, but then I ended up, I taught for a few semesters at um, Drexel University, the freshman literature survey. And that was interesting. The first year they made me teach at eight o'clock in the morning. That is cruel and unusual punishment for the kids. The second, the second semester, they moved it back to nine o'clock in the morning, which was, at least they were awake by then, you know. But I love those kids. And it's interesting because they had such an inferiority complex being next door to Penn. Mm. And I would say to them, when I walk across campus, I can't tell which one is a Penn student, which one's a Drexel student. That's I, right. You can't tell. So they would tell me, well, the ones with the protractors coming out of their pocket, those are the Drexel students. <laughs> But the kids were wonderful. I wow. absolutely love them. But I'm very involved in Penn alumni affairs as well. I love my alma mater. And, Great. You know, I uh, got a lot out of it and got a Master of Arts in English Literature. Totally worthless degree, but I enjoyed doing it at the time. I thought well, Bo Bonnie, you're in good company. It sounds like the First Lady teaches English as well. Oh, Dr. Jill Biden. Dr. Joe Biden. So there you go. There's Bonnie Squires, Dr. Joe Biden. <laughs> and it's funny because there was an op-ed where some creepy guy said, she's not a medical doctor. You shouldn't call her a doctor. Well, there's been such outrage that he dared. He they, I saw one letter that said, what, you want us to call her kiddo? 
I mean, she earned a doctorate. That's who you call her. She's Dr. Jill Biden. And there have been a lot of letters to the editor. I that saw that. Yes, mm -hmm. that are defending the, you know, the PhD. Absolutely. So I never got, I, I got like within 50 credits of getting a PhD at Temple, but it wasn't anything I was going to use for the career that I had uh, evolved into, which right. was communications consultant. So I never really finished, but I enjoyed the courses and I worked at Temple for a number of years under Peter Leocorus. I was a special assistant to him. Wow. Did a lot of things that are still in place at Temple. And every time I see the Temple T banners, I say, I had those made. Peter said that's what he wanted, and I was able to carry them. It was one of the many tasks that I had. I had so many business cards at Temple. I was the only one that had more than one business card, but I had a lot of responsibilities. At the same time, in my spare time, I was editing the alumni magazine. Wow. I, I love that. I love the alumni. Mag as an alumni, I get the alumni magazine now, too, so I, I love that. Wow, you touched uh, from high school in, in Delaware County to Penn to Temple Education in lots of places. I went to Lower Marion. And Lower Marion, wow. Montgomery County, absolutely. Montgomery County, Delaware County, Philadelphia County, you touch education everywhere. Yeah, and uh, people don't realize how important an early educator, early childhood educator is in the life of a child mm. and how important that is. And Jim, Jim Roebuck, who is a friend of mine, um, who just finished 35 years of being a state rep on the education committee, he always was pointing out that that gives kids the best start in life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he has been an amazing champion, agreed. Um, from the youngest ages to uh, all the way through high school age for children and for education. Well, every, so. everything that Rendell did as governor that was education reform came from Jim Roebuck's pen. Mm. And I'm hoping that Roebuck will be appointed to the Philadelphia School Board because he's interested in that. And he would be a great addition. Jerry Jordan, the, uh, the president of the PFT agrees. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens when the mayor gets around to making the appointments. Yeah. Carol Walston would be a good person to put on the school board. Well, well, I don't know about that. That's another full-time job, Bonnie. That's true. That's I, true. Oh my goodness. No, no. Maybe a retirement. Well, you're not going to retire for a while. <laughs> A long time, Carol. Not for not for a while. Anyway, not for a while. It was a pleasure talking to you, talking about the merger with the Terry Lynn Lokov Child Care Foundation. And I'm looking forward to the virtual teacher award ceremony next May. So our guest today has been Carol Austin. And we're coming to you from well, virtually from mainline television, Radnor Studio 21. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.